wandered around school for a bit and then came back and gave him a letter, gave my teacher a letter. What the letter hinted is that I wanted to become the greatest architect in the world. Picked up the camera for the first time in a while and learned how to do lighting and studio work. So I think that was the kind of moment I realised that, yeah, this is what I want to do. We talk with creatives and share insights with the world to help us understand their dreams. Like, what is your why? Or what is your purpose? Join us on this quest to understand Ati Solomon Tairao and John Belford Lelau. I guess I'm just really um, trying to answer my own questions and trying to understand who I am. And that's the only way I can further it out through my creative process. You know, actually really starting up the Mouse Studio started off with a very, very you know, ambitious goal. Hi, my name is Pati Solomon Tyrell. I'm a photographer and performance artist. I'm part of a collective called Festwag. It's a young queer Pacific arts collective here based in Auckland. <laughs> no, um, my name is John Buffett and I'm a social designer here at Mouse Studio. Uh, Mouse Studio is a social design practice and we look to create human centered responses to human challenges such as. Uh, poverty, inequality and environmental challenges that many of our people face today. And there's four of us, four directors, and we started up in 2017. Uh, and we're working across uh, different institutions here in New Zealand, Philippines and Samoa. I don't think I, I knew that I wanted to, to do exactly what I'm doing at the moment, but I definitely knew I wanted to do something in the creative sector. I, I, all throughout my high school um, experience, I was only taking art subjects. And so I was in design, photography, and then I went to tertiary studies. And I went to fashion school. That wasn't for me. Dropped out, and then I had to do. I guess the moment was when I had to do two years of labour work, and just realizing like, nah, I, I definitely need to be in the creative sector, doing and um, just using my talents and my skills that I have. And so I went back to surgery studies and yeah, kind of picked up the camera for the first time in a while and learned how to do lighting and studio work. So I think that was the kind of moment I realized that, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to capture people in, yeah, portraiture. Ah, the first spark kind of really started when I wanted to be an architect. Um, you know, being year nine, or I think I was 13 over at De La Salle College and I was a bit of a whole heart, a bit of a naughty kid getting kicked out of class and stuff. Anyway, I got kicked out of one class and it was graphics um, and you know that was what I was really interested in and got kicked out once and then they said don't come back in unless you have a good reason why. Uh, wandered around school for a bit and then came back and gave him a letter, gave my teacher a letter. And what the letter had said is that I wanted to become the greatest architect in the world. So it was, it was definitely when I was doing the labour work and I was just like, I'm just not meant to be doing this. You know, I just felt like I needed to do something creative and I was wasting away at something else that I didn't want to do. Uh, and so from year 13, oh well from 13, I then moved on and you know, architecture and uh, creativity became my passion. Um, and then finally got different opportunities to go across to Aboriginal communities in Australia and um, doing a number of different projects in architecture studies, which really showed me how I can use my architectural skills for social impact. I don't think it, anyone realizes how big like their journey becomes. I think I was just, I think when you're honest and making work about, yeah, I think when you're just honest with your work, I feel uh, people will naturally um, grasp onto your work and I think that's probably why my work has kind of expanded or kind of been popular recently. Kind of when you start speaking about these different moments, I um, got in the Philippines where you know I really had that clicky moment where it showed me this is, this is the kind of work that I really want to be doing. Uh, some people may call it humanitarian design or humanitarian architecture but uh, here we look, like to call it social design which is, you know, holistic approaches to human challenges through design. Well, a lot of my work has deals with identity and 
my own identity. You know, um, being a young queer someone man and just trying to navigate that space through life. And just, I'm, I guess I'm just really um, trying to answer my own questions and trying to understand who I am. And that's the only way I can figure it out is through my creative processes. You know, and the thing with, with Amazing Purposes is that, you know, I like that someone saying it's sweet thing I told my father, right? You know, that the form changes, but the underlying principles remain. Um, so, you know, working with low socioeconomic communities, such as the ones that I was brought up in, I kind of lived in most of my life, I still am. <laughs> Uh, and you know, doing this work in, in New York and doing the stuff in the Philippines, I all saw that um, you know there were different countries, different forms, different kinds of projects. But you know, really, what I was was doing was uh, you know, providing these opportunities to become better people, to become more prosperous. But you know, kind of back, coming back to Mel Studio, um, our vision or our purpose as a practice is how do we enable other people to find their Mel? I just want to hopefully answer these questions for myself and if it helps other people then that, that's awesome. My purpose or my mal is to also enable other people to find their mal. Mm. So tying all of these programs and what I'm doing and these projects and my purpose is I believe I'm able to have, enable people to find their own purpose too. I think the biggest thing in terms of um, hardship within the creative industries the financing of things when you're beginning in the um, arts there's not much uh, there's not much money and so you know when you're living away from home in another city and you're trying to pursue this you know full-time art career there's always this you know financial financial problems that you're trying to like fix while you're also trying to pursue this career. I'm fortunate to be in like a collective of 13 artists who are like-minded and work in similar um, in similar kind of ways with me. And so it's always been good to have that that group behind you, that that support. And so it's also like another family away from home. And so for yeah, just being from a collective, having the numbers behind you in those times that you need help really just pushes you past the hardships. Definitely, uh, I wouldn't say it was a point of throwing in the towel. I've never actually really thought of throwing in the towel. Um, but I definitely get those questionable moments, eh? <laughs> Where you're questioning life, what the hell am I doing right now? Um, but then one of the more, um, you know, uh, moments that I remember was being over in New York. Uh, so at this point I was working in a bar, which was amazing. Um, and then also doing, you know, work with, uh, with open architecture, um, which was voluntary. So I was working, you know, 12 hours, you know, at a bar and then having three hours sleeping and waking up and doing all of this uh, voluntary work. Mm -hmm. But then that was happening for a month and two months and it slowly starts burning you out and grinding you out. Uh, and then I really got to those points where I was oh gosh, because my, I'd never wanted to work for an architecture firm over in New York. But then being in these moments, really, you really start questioning, you know, your position and what you're doing and your motives. I mean, so at that point I started applying for architecture firms. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh no! And I realized that I was like, I cracked! <laughs> Yeah, it's the thing of not wanting to do anything else. It's the passion for the art. Um, that's fun. That's what I enjoy doing. Like, I really don't want to do anything else. I want to keep going until I, I can make it financially. I can make it this bigger thing in my life. There, it just takes care of me as well. Um, it's been, um, you know, a bit of a journey, and uh, you know, actually, really starting up. Mal Studio started off with a very, very, you know, ambitious goal. You know, especially when you're saying, you know, I want to help people find their purpose. You know, what's if they don't find their purpose? You know, the thing of representation is my why. Just knowing as a Samoan artist, as a queer artist, as a person of color, and the work that I do in terms of representation and creating this catalogue of portraiture of imagery. 
iconography that my people can look to, the things that I missed from when I was you know, a kid, was not seeing myself in the media, not seeing myself anywhere. And so what I hope to do in my, oh, my why is, yeah, to be that difference and create that difference. You know, going through this journey, I, I met um, a lady and an elder over in, in Toronto. And she says, you know, the way to counter my fear really was kind of living through our core values. Mm. And, you know, she said these, these are the core values or the seven values or seven teachings that all of our indigenous communities used to live by. You know, it was humility, it was respect, it was honesty, truth, uh, bravery, wisdom, um, and love. And loving each other is very important, but she said it was, you know, the self-love and really understanding who you are. Um, loving your faults and, you know, loving your strengths and vice versa, loving them equally as each other. And so really, I was just really trying to push about how do I bring these seven values across my work, into my work, into my architecture practice. Or I feel like I'm really doing it. I'm creating a catalogue of imagery of brown people being powerful, showing that mana that we, that we have. And yeah, just having a massive kind of catalogue of imagery for our people to see themselves in. I think that would be kind of the legacy. The legacy that I want to be leaving behind in architecture practice is how does social design or social impact work become more of a normal thing? It's more normalised within these education institutions. There are more opportunities for people to engage in it, both in an entrepreneurial sense and in a practical sense and, you know, a career pathway. You know, I'd like to say that I was 30, 40, 50 years from now that I had an impact on that. Say one day that I was part of ending poverty in Aotearoa and also ending poverty in you know, in the global sense too. Constantly using my platforms to be engaging in that fight, to constantly push my cultural boundaries, you know, within the Samoan context and within the Pacific and Oceanic context is really resurfacing a lot of this ancestral knowledge uh, and really pushing the boundaries on what that ancestral knowledge means in the contemporary sense uh, and how that can influence generations to come.